All right, so we are live. Thank you all for tuning in. My name is Mike Veal. I'm the president and founder of Global Conservation Force, and I have the honor tonight of having Jungle Jordan on. And hey, we're going to talk shop and conservation and uh, kind of talk how we got our start and how we hope to inspire you guys to do the same. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have to say from my side, uh, many of my GCF team members have said in the past, hey, you and Jungle Jordan got to hop on and I'm always buried in something. So I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. And then uh, just was like scrolling through Instagram the other day. I was like, you know, it's probably time. I've got free time this week. We might as well get some <laughs> some chatting going. Right. No, it's, that's, that's funny because um, I've been talking to, to Mike Bona. And uh, he's he's a, a good, you know good friend of mine, and and he was um he told me to mention that it was a uh, smart move to recruit him to the team. So <laughs> that's he actually told me to tell you guys. So. You know what? That totally sounds like Mike. Oh yeah, uh, it's Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna assume that uh, if you know Mike well, then you know the draft world well. I do. I do. I, I don't I wouldn't say I know it as well as he does, but I'm definitely a uh, former draft keeper myself and uh, I've definitely been around drafts. There are a lot of different animals though, so but I like drafts. I do. I actually have my uh one of my giraffe masks uh, that I was wearing earlier today. So <laughs> and as as you can see my logo oh, hold on a minute is a giraffe print. So Oh cool. Yeah. Uh, I bet you are scoring major points with, with Mike right now. Oh no, he he he's very happy. I mean, he <laughs> he was the, he sent me a picture of a. I, I made a couple shirts. Um, they were for Wild Wednesdays. It's some little segment that I do, and uh, they say Wild on it. And there's a the giraffe head and the replace and to replace the the eye that my wife designed. And uh, he cool. bought one of those and he was wearing it. And uh, he loves those giraffes. I know that. Yeah. Well, he's. Uh... If if he didn't tell you, he's now our draft project coordinator. Um, oh, yeah, he, I, yeah, I saw, I saw. I'm, uh, I was happy to hear about that. that. That's pretty cool stuff. It's a, it's a big deal. The conservation is very important. So, yeah, you guys are doing great stuff over there. Thanks. Yeah, we, we're yeah. stoked. Uh, we're stoked to have Mike's experience on board. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mike Bona is a senior uh, zookeeper and wildlife care specialist working out of Los Angeles and. He is. He just recently signed onto the team to run up our conservation efforts dedicated to giraffe uh, and help create more projects in that realm. Um, so under GCF, we have multiple different project coordinators and conservation officers within the dedicated team, and everybody uh, helps everybody with these different projects and development. But coordinators kind of run the life cycle of specific different, uh, I guess, animal universes and umbrella-based efforts. So. Uh, that's how Mike's on the team. So for you, yes. wh where did you get started? I mean, how did, how did you become a zookeeper? How did that whole trail start? So the, the, the humble beginnings, <laughs> I will say, um, I started out, I mean, as a kid, I, I was always obsessed with animals. I always was curious about staring at them and, and watching their behavior and looking at the bugs behind my house and the little garden that we had, a little little patch of dirt, wasn't really a garden. Um, and then uh, there was this nesting pair of eagles that would come back every year and have their babies and see the kids, see the babies fly off. And that was kind of like the first intro to like, you know, animals for me, like, you know, early on. And um, I've always been obsessed with them. You know, and um, as a kid, I had anger management issues. I grew up with ADHD and OCD, so um, I had a trouble trouble past a little bit. I was, it was it was hard. People, you know, kids used to make fun of me because I would get angry very quickly, so they thought it was hilarious. So they would tease me to get me angry. Oh, and my mom found out that I was always uh, happiest around animals, and so she tried her best to connect me with the local zoo and oh, cool. i was 11 years old and uh you know it was it's not something that zoos allow normally right. but they pulled some strings some strings and allowed me to volunteer in the family farm area with the goats and the sheep and the all uh, the you know the chickens and stuff like that as long as i had a chaperone a zookeeper chaperone was with me at all times and um so i, I learned how to you know 
train rabbits and walk walk sheep on leashes and things. And I learned a lot of stuff from this young age. And ever since then, I haven't really left the zoo world. Um, I've been, I've had multiple jobs, you know, up to zoo people. I've had um, volunteer experiences, internships. My senior thesis was with Komodo dragons at the zoo that I worked at uh, eventually. Um, and just step after step after step. And now I'm here as a zookeeper, but my position now is a little different. I use social media on, you know, besides zookeeping, I'm more into in the education world right now. So I'm doing other stuff. That's pretty cool though. Yeah. So, uh, you kind of had a similar background to, I mean, most of us in the, the industry, very rarely will you talk to a, a wildlife care specialist or a zookeeper or a rehab person they're like oh yeah i just supplied and i got it right away uh <laughs> that doesn't no. really happen in our industry at all uh you, you never everybody's put in a lot of uh volunteer hours and internships and uh, multiple certification courses and really just kept getting their foot in the door so that people could see how hard you know your work ethic is and how dedicated you were uh so that's, I mean, I can relate to that too. Uh, I mean, same, same thing growing up here in Southern California, always catching lizards and snakes and, uh, the wild animal park was in our backyard, you know, roughly speaking, it was just a 20 minute drive away basically. And yeah. that's where we used to go all the time as kids. And that was my, uh, first set of dream goals, you know, kind of getting into the field and working with animals. <laughs> oh, as you can hear one of mine saying hello. Yeah, I have my door closed, so we my my little cats can't uh, can't come in here right now. <laughs> I would expect uh, probably a cameo from Odin tonight. He's he's uh, the GCF canine unit ambassador. He's a Belgian Malinois, so you'll see you'll see, you'll probably see his ears, and once he gets more restless, he'll probably s step up right Pop behind up. me on the couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a friend who trains, um, who's helped train, um, so, you know, some some of those dogs to to go out and actually be in Africa and, you know, doing, doing, um, security work basically. And it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Anti-poaching yeah. work. And it's, those dogs are amazing. Yeah. We've, uh, we've got an entire crew of, uh, fur missiles as we call them as a joke. Uh, the fur Malinois missile. team is the, is the fur missile team and the, uh, the Dutch shepherd that we have also, but he's young. Uh, but we, uh, we've got, nine of our own canines now lab bavarian hound dutch shepherd uh belgian malinois and then we support over 30 different anti-poaching units which is a host of dozens more canines under each team wow. and their handlers but uh wow. training them is pretty cool i mean so to talk training uh mm -hmm. you know working in the zookeeper field uh opera conditioning positive base reinforcement uh, it's the same thing for those canines. Uh, mm -hmm. You're working with their, you know, inset behaviors and desires and, and really their true motivations, building upon it, rewarding with positive based trust building. And uh, like our, our crew, uh, some of them are, are apprehension dogs, some of them are tracking, some of them are scent detection, um, but they're an amazing team member to have in the field of uh, frontline wildlife protection. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that's training. Training is very important to see, you know, especially, um, you know, with, with some people don't really realize that, you know, zoo animals in, in a sense can also be trained right. um, with the same exact methods that are used for domestic animals, or they can be for, you know, that, that the same stuff you can train a dog, the same methods, the same, way that you train a dog can be used to train a hippo you know it's it's pretty impressive stuff like um but with with the animals in the zoos our methods of training um kind of differ from from you know they're not doing security work like they're not right they're not <laughs> yeah. anti hippos aren't anti-poaching even though they <laughs> kind of are on their own out there in the wild they kind of do that they are anti-poachers yeah they, they're they're gonna food. keep us as rangers away from them that's for sure if we there, here and see them we're, we're booking it there you go um but yeah the, but the animals in the, in the facilities that i work in they you know need health care you know and why not get them involved in their own healthcare? So what the training that we do is uh, to help them help themselves. So one of the hippos I used to work with, she 
was trained, um, you know, to open her mouth, uh, so we can see her teeth and her tongue and all the stuff on the inside of her mouth. Um, you know, she can she can go down and roll on her side. This large animal is capable of doing a lot of stuff and moving that three thousand pound body over on the, her side to show us her underbelly and her feet. It's pretty impressive stuff, you know. Like it is. It's 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 so impressive. You know, I think too. What's what's so cool about training is, especially it's so in the term of like husbandry husbandry based training, where you're working on in in the zoological term of training behaviors to aid in their own care and welfare. Uh, it's they have choice and control. So like you're not going to walk in and put a hippo on a leash like you would with a dog and be like, hey, let's go for a walk. You've got no. to create a language, <laughs> and then a trust based relationship so that when you're working on something like maybe they do have a, an actual toothache and right. it might be slightly uncomfortable. They know that they can trust you and you can trust them when you're working on these procedures and you might be working with a vet to do a voluntary blood draw or maybe uh, clean around the base, base of the tooth. Uh, it's really important stuff. And it, it also translates to with the like wildlife rehab and release side when mm -hmm. species can be trained hands-free and, removed from the person directly being there, you can remove the imprint of the actual person so that animal is more successful in the field for release. So right. it's some, some cool stuff uh, when you know the world of training, I guess, the, the world of uh, different styles of training. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm like, for, for me, I, I am no, definitely no expert trainer. You know, I'm, I'm very much I mean, I'm not really a, a beginner, but, you know, I'm definitely, you know, in the early stages of, of training. Um, it, training is, is very tough stuff. And, uh, you know, it requires a lot of patience. And that was something I didn't have as a kid, you know, with, you know, with the, the problems that I have. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> you know, if you met me today, you wouldn't, like, unless you were a psychiatrist, you probably wouldn't notice my issues. You know, <laughs> I keep them well hidden. You know, I've definitely, uh, definitely grown up a bit, um, but I feel like most of that stuff comes out with uh, the over talking. I, I talk a lot um, and I notice, I think this is also how I've been able to, to be so interested, so decently, so decent at recognizing animal behavior and changes because I'm very, I hyper focus on behavior and not just animals, people. I see, I notice small things people do, you know, like ticks or nervous habits or random things like that. I'm very, I'm very hypersensitive to that, you know, and I, and I think coming to acceptance of that has allowed me to, you know, better my mindset. And like, I, I've been able to accept who I am, you know, cause I've, I consider some of my things a flaw, like um, with, you know, sometimes like people smacking, chewing loudly on their food with their mouth open. Yes. You know, I know, I know a lot of people have a problem with that, but mine's a little bit more aggressive, you know, especially when I was a kid. I keep it, I keep it inside now. I block it out now. But as a kid, I would sit there at my dinner table with my sister across from me. And if she spoke with her mouth open while chewing her food, I would sit there like this. <laughs> and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't finish my food until she was gone. I would wait to eat until she left. And, and, you know, I love you, Jasmine. That's my sister. So she, she's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, I probably, I mean, that's a, a pretty common one for most of us. I mean, that'll get, that'll get a lot of people under the skin too. If it's like right in front of you, you're like, oof. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough life, but um, I'm happy. I, I'm better for acknowledging it now, I think. And uh, I think people have a problem with that with, you know, accepting themselves for who they are. Um, so yeah. that's like, that's what, that's kind of what I like to do with my social media. Um, I like to push people to, you know, to, to realize it's okay to be who you are and to follow your passions without thinking about, you know, certain things that can stop you from it. You know, like you don't let anything stop you from following yeah. your, your dreams. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I was uh, I was on another talk broadcast last night with uh, Lonnie Pike, who's uh, sh her tag is uh, gray hair and tattoos, and oh, yeah. she is living the same lifestyle of preaching: be who you are, you know, embrace who you are. Don't try to hide it. 
uh, we all have flaws and faults and are all working on something and uh, sometimes are weathering a storm and not showing it. But, you know, uh, you know, that's where being uh, not only lending a hand, but being kind, uh, sure. it really helps. And uh, working to kind of always, I guess, uh, better, better the situation for yourself and others at all times and trying to trying to always take that high road cuz like you said you know you never know uh what somebody's going through and you right. know like you getting a break uh to come and work at the zoo i mean that was a life altering path to uh, tell you the, the honest truth about that you know like as a kid i would get into fights over and over and over and and all of a sudden there was a switch and i stopped getting suspended I stopped getting expelled from school. I stopped, just things stopped. And I didn't really think about this until most recently in my life. And I was like, God, I, like, I was just thinking, I wonder why, I mean, I was wondering, maybe I'm just, I just was growing up and, and uh, you know, maturing, but it was after I started volunteering with the zoo, those following years, that's when I, I someone pointed it out to me. I was like, you're right. <laughs> like, that's so, I, that's pretty cool it, it blows my mind it, like i i had a certain 13 when i turned 13 i no more suspensions um the occasional argument with kids but you know no more suspensions <laughs> nothing like that I, I was once i hit high school that was it i, I don't know I, that, that the zoo really the animals really did, did save me i feel you know they really kept me focused and they gave me focus. So that's, that's why I'm so passionate about animals now. Like that, something about them, you know, it's life. I, that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I can respect that. I mean, I, I, uh, I think giving uh, the voiceless a voice and uh, protecting those who can't protect themselves against us, you know, human beings has been my biggest drive. Uh, you know, and a similar thing and a focus. Uh, I mean, it's kind of comical. Now you're, you're talking about childhood. Like, I mean, I definitely was a brawler growing up, which I, I don't necessarily always share with folks. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, hey, hey, it is what it's it okay. is. Like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of yeah. comical. Uh, I was very much into the rockabilly, psychabilly scene. So I was always like when I was a teenager, I was, at Los, like in Los Angeles at these hot rod and <laughs> biker shows at <laughs> the punk rock shows and stuff. And I mean, okay. if somebody, you know, this is, sounds so stupid to even say it now, but you know, if somebody started crap back then and, uh, yeah. or was picking a fight with somebody who couldn't, uh, really defend themselves, I had no yeah. issue jumping in to stop it, which is kind of mm -hmm. weird. Cause like, I realized much later, like I was always jumping in to defend somebody else and it wasn't necessarily with my place. So learning right. to stop doing that was a yeah. thing for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so the, <laughs> it's kind of funny to think about I, it actually. No, you know, am I still here? Well, I lost you there. I yes. think it was me actually. Cause my, uh, my reception is real bad. So let me see. I think my computer snagged my, e my internet. I, uh, I lit, I live in S Southern California when I'm not working in Africa and Asia, but the comical thing is my, uh, yep. That's exactly what happened. Uh, my internet is terrible here. It's like Africa bad or like with, <laughs> oh, on, on the patrol. Like, yeah. I, like you're down I, in the middle of the, you know, the, <laughs> the wilderness. Uh, yeah, like I, I live in a valley between some mountains and, uh, you know, oh, yeah. routinely have, you know, mountain lions crossing through the property area and stuff like Ooh. that. And uh, like, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I try to find the remoteness when I'm home as well. Uh, but it does make it challenging to do some of these right. things where like I'm basically streaming off my phone because we can't even get like a, a satellite internet Ooh. signal in here. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> it's, it's all good. I, I dig it. You know, I just got to make yeah. it what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah, sorry. You were saying at, at, at the break of that there, uh, I was just kind of laughing at myself for sharing that. But uh, I mean, it is what it is now. I mean, it kind of makes sense, you know, myself becoming an anti-poaching ranger and working in frontline 
uh, wildlife protection conflict based you know issues around the world uh you like the same people same thing just yeah. you know just a little different now just uh, a lot more focused and task driven there you go <laughs> not so random <laughs> <laughs> random brawls yeah I'm like hey leave that dude alone he didn't say anything to you i'm like and eh, swack you know it's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't need to be doing this all the time <laughs> no that's okay you know i like i like i was saying i i with with me and and the fights you know it's just it was a part of my it was a part of it was a part of who i, who I am and who i was you know like it it's funny to this day because people that know me now when I tell them about the fighting and stuff, they're like, no way. Like, they know how this, me smiling, this is me all the time. Like, yeah. I'm always smiling. And and they're like, there's no way you could be, like, you could get into fights with people. I was like, yeah, you just you just didn't know. But that was a part of me. And, and you know, unfortunately, which is kind of how my face works, uh, when I'm not, I, I my mom used to always say this as a, when I was a kid, because my anger took over me and I would I would frown all the time. Right, like to th- and even thinking. So if I'm in deep thought, my brows furrow, furrow, and it's just like, am I here? Okay, yeah, like it looks are. like I'm angry at all times. Are you frozen? I think I glitched for a second. There. Hello, <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now, but you're okay. There you are. Sorry, you were frozen for a minute. Yeah, you're frozen again. Okay, are we good? think i can still hear you there Oop. okay can you, i'm moving i'm ticking on we're like, going there it is i was gonna say okay. uh, sorry it's 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 probably glitching for you and i but i think it's probably still live for everybody watching okay good sorry <laughs> okay anyways well let me finish that story um just like it just used to make me laugh because my mom said you know, if i still you know stuck my eyebrows like that that would stay would stay like that right and now when people see me when i'm not smiling my face kind of looks very serious. So it's it's very unfortunate. I have very deep eyebrows, deep arching eyebrows. So it's just kind of how it works. And you know, and my, my wife now is very into skincare. And so she's always trying to tell me to relax my face and she'll smack me right here so I don't create all these wrinkles and stuff. And I'm like, eh, I'll do it. I, I, I hey. It happens. It's, yeah, you're like whatever. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I want to take care of my skin. As you know, I, she's she's helped me with that. I'm trying. I'm trying. I get like, it. Yeah. So in this time frame of being a a, a zookeeper, wildlife care specialist, and like education outreach host, what what uh, what are some of the stories that stand out to you outside of like what was your favorite species to work with, and was there a time like sharing your educational reach that like really was an aha moment that you made you want to stay on this path. Yeah. Okay. So my favorite species to work with, I would probably say I really, I really enjoy um, river otters and, and bears, grizzly bears. Those are my favorite, some of my favorite groupings of animals to work with because bears are so sweet. So, so smart, so loving most, most species that I've seen, like the black bears and the grizzlies are really chill. Um, I've heard sloth bears can kind of have a little bit of uh, attitude at times, um, but most of the bears are really loving, and you just wouldn't assume this big, gigantic animal, you know, is so dainty. Like you could feed a bear a grape, and they would take it like <laughs> this with their lips and just ever so gently. And it, oh man, and then the otters, they're just so wanting to work with you. They're so, they, they want to be social. They want to learn. They want, they're so smart. That all intelligence the is family, there. Yeah. Like all the mustelids, all the, so the wolverines, the skunks, the fishers, honey badger, you know, badgers, all the ba- badgers, all these guys, they, they, uh, guys and girls, they, they just want to, they're so feisty, <laughs> but so great. Um, my favorite animal period are cheetahs and I've never been able to work with them. So, That'll be a day that I, that I cry when that happens. Oh um, man, get get the get the cameras ready there, right? To, oh no, yeah, one hundred percent. Life moment right there. One hundred percent. I am going to cry when I meet a cheetah up close. I don't know how I haven't out of all these years, but it's going to happen. Um, now, as far as stories that I learned that I wanted to do this, do the social media more frequently, or that I learned that I I had maybe a voice 
to pass on to others was when I was walking by, again, the hippo exhibit, the hippos and the rhinos, two different exhibits. So there's the hippo one was when I was walking by and I just uh, given a treat to the, to the girls, the girl hippos. And um, I was talking a little bit because it's kind of what I do throughout the day. I'll give random talks that are not scheduled and I'll just kind of just go on a tangent to people. And I remember when I was done, this kid, little, little, little black kid uh, look, looks very similar to me, came up to me and he, uh, this is before, it's pre-COVID clearly, a couple years ago. He, he like pulled on my shirt and he says, hey, I want to be a zookeeper just like you. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you do? And I, it, no, but just it might just be where I live or most places. It's it's very rare. Uh oh, okay. It's very rare. It's slight lag. It's that okay. people of the that I see people of color. Is it still going? Am I stuck? You're good. You're good. Am I still going? It's just tripping okay. a little. Um, it's very okay. It's very rare that I would see. Okay, it's very rare that I would see people of color. You know, you know, um, coming to the zoo, and the, I just think because. It can be pretty expensive for people to come to the zoo. And and I know growing up, people didn't know that where I live, people didn't know that zookeeping was an option. They didn't know that was it was a job. Even though they may have liked animals, they didn't know they could pursue a career in it because they, they didn't think it was for for them. Because what they see on TV back then was, you know, like Jeff Corwin, the the wild, the core uh, the, the the crap brothers, Steve Irwin, David Attenborough, guys like that, you know, um, and they didn't see anybody that looked like me or look like them. So I've learned that, hey, I might have something here because I can I can talk to people pretty well. I'm okay at talking to people. And <laughs> I saw this might be a chance that I should I should probably try to reach more to, to change, you know, in this 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 world. And I learned um that I was different in this field. There was the you know, I didn't I hadn't really seen any other black zookeepers. So that was a big emphasis on me you know, pursuing the the job. And um again the with the with the rhinos, I gave I used to give talks to the rhinos and this was like in a little amphitheater thing. And there was this summer group that would come back and listen to my talk every single day. Oh, and wow. they were a group of like 10 and 11 year olds. And I'm like, you know, I'm pretty much I had to be on my game. I had to tell them different facts each time they came to watch me and it was, it was crazy because i couldn't just keep giving them the same info right and so and they're probably asking harder questions every they single were time. asking harder questions each time these kids are so smart and i remember asking them i said you know after like maybe like day six of this right i said okay how many of you guys want to be a zookeeper raise your hands i would say 12 out of the 15 kids raise their hands to be a zookeeper. So I was like, cool. what? And then the, I said, what I said, the other three, what do you guys want to do? Uh, one said vet, one said wild, wildlife uh, photographer. And it was all animal stuff. Like, and I can't remember what the third one was, but it was animal related as well. And I was like, man, they, you guys are really dedicated. And um, no offense to my coworker. I remember, um, <laughs> I remember I was, I wasn't given the talk that day. And I remember the kids walked over to the to the amphitheater to to listen, and I, I I feel kind of bad for this, but they said, "Hey, we're just coming here to listen to your talk again." I said, "Oh, I'm not doing it. Um, my coworker is," and uh, they were like, "Oh, really? Oh, okay." Oh I no! I was like, "Oh, ouch!" My coworker, I was like, "He gives good talks." He's like, yeah, but they had specific questions for you. And I was like, oh, okay. They're like, we're going to try to stump them this time. We've gotten harder and harder and harder. Okay. And now we're pros. Well, then they would ask me questions like, how did they become a zookeeper and things like that? Oh, and, of course. you know, and that really, I've, I found that I, with my talks, I've, I've learned different techniques. I've made, I've made it more engaging. Instead of just talking and throwing facts at you, I like to bring in crowd involvement and crowd engagement. I like to see sure. what, what they know. And it's so funny because the kids, the younger kids, when like in a random group of crowd, group of kids, group of people, the the kids know more than the parents. You yes. Know? Like yes. I'll, I'll ask questions like, hey, what's a rhino's horn made out of? And people would, all the adults would say bone and the kids would raise their hand, no. 
it's keratin, fingernails and hair. I was like, like, <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we get the same thing. Like we'll do, we'll do different college or, you know, shoot up every age group. And like, you'll, you'll hit like a six year old in a crowd who you swear was prepped by like a PhD. You're like, how did you know these questions even to ask? And you're like floor. You're like, the kid's like, so is it true that uh, rhino horn is made of keratin and that if you were to pick it up, it's heavy and dense and, but it, it, it almost is hair like and slivers and you're like, dang kid, like that's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're learning it from, from, from the different shows and the different, the different apps that they can use. And cause a lot of these kids have iPads, you know, and, and there's a lot of these like um, early learning apps that really teach a whole lot of stuff. And it's pretty crazy to me. I'm like, wow. You know, when I was a kid, oh, what did I, I think I finally put them away. I used to read zoo books, oh, the, yeah. little, the magazine subscription. Yep. And uh, I, to this day, I, I can attribute most of my uh, knowledge to those books, you know, and most of my animal knowledge. And it's, I mean, that's just how it goes. Like that's, well, that's how I got started, obviously. Like I, I'm not just only going off <laughs> of zoo books. Cause <laughs> 1970s, 1980s well, you know, books. Like there's, there's like a giraffe book, right? And it's like talking about the different species of giraffe, which has clearly changed since the 80s and 90s, right? Yes. They've reclassified them so many times, and it still bothers me, and I don't like talking about it. So let's move on to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good tangent story. Right. Okay, so uh, the field of conservation is challenging en enough. Uh, not yeah. only are you working in multiple areas with multiple projects, different approaches from community, ranger force, veterinary, uh, when there are global disagreements, uh, yeah. things like giraffe. Uh, in 2015, I was at the Giraffe in Daba in South Africa, and I was listening to the 18 most sought after experts in giraffe, and no one could agree on the species and subspecies. And I'm sitting there from the anti-poaching, uh, counter wildlife trafficking column going, we need to get past this because this isn't important right now. Like this, we got to get past this. Like we all have to agree so we can move on. And uh, it was, it, it eventually got settled, but it take, took a couple of years. And as you know, it's a different format and it's DNA based right. and everything now. Uh, but it, it's comical to bring that up because uh, there are so many little intricacies in all of these backgrounds. So like, you know, becoming a, a, a zookeeper uh, working yeah. in the field of conservation and uh, kind of learning the path and other people's struggles helps you not only advance through what you're seeing, but helps you be better at bettering the system. Right. Uh, <laughs> so when these kids are asking you these really hard questions, you're like, dang, I gotta be ready next time. And, uh, but yeah. you're also at the same time, you're the key spark. You're the key right. spark for them to really be passionate. One of my, one of my, um, so like what, so with my social media, I'll, I'll do these uh, different things called like Wild Wednesday, right? That's when I post a picture zoomed in of an animal and people have to guess what it is. And, uh, you know, afterwards I'll go live that, you know, that night and talk about it a little bit. And I purposely will pick animals I don't know that well. So I, I actually love to learn right obviously i love to learn but i like to learn with them and we discuss it together and then when especially when i don't know the animal there are people that have worked with these said animals that you know are you know nice enough to want to go live with me to discuss what they're like in person and I, that's kind of the what i've been able to to kind of bring with like what i've been lucky enough to bring with social media and uh connect with people in the zoo world the zoo world's a very um close knit community i feel like um, yes. you know, and, and it's, it's people, I feel like everyone knows everyone and it's insane. Oh <laughs> it's yeah. Pretty, oh yeah. Pretty crazy. So I like having the opportunity to, to, to be able to connect with zookeepers and that they, they acknowledge me as one of them. That was, that's something that's always been very important to me. Um, you oh, know, sure. Yeah. Cause fitting <laughs> in the world. The, yeah. Cause sometimes the, uh, the PR ambassadors of facilities or the spokespeople are not actual wildlife care folks. And so that can sometimes unintentionally drive a rift between right. actual keepers 
uh, and the street cred of the uh, the actual, you know, production team or whoever it may be. Um, so I totally, I can totally relate to that. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, more than half of the GCF team has worked in the zoological field in animal care, animal rehab, uh, and and all these factors. And the connection of the dots is always comical because, you know, we'll be at a conference or someone will be doing, you know, a project and they're like, oh, I know such and such. I'm like, where, where did you meet them? And then, oh, I knew, met them here. And it's a tiny world. Uh, right. I mean, right. even less common than, a, you know, like some of the other smaller professions. There's not necessarily a zoological facility in every town. Um, right. Right. So. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ooh, I'm gonna oh. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just fixing. I just realized we have a bunch of comments in here too. Sure, let's let's uh, let's go. With it. We got okay, bunch of bunch of nice comments in here from folks. Uh, someone was expecting to see a draft. Sorry, it, it is a little difficult to fit them in uh, our virtual world here. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment. Uh, <laughs> I can't tell if that person was being serious or not. Was that it? Was it like? <laughs> I, you know, I, with, uh, sometimes with text, it's hard to say, uh, a lot of people saying that, you know, they could relate to your story, which is awesome. I'm not sure if you can see the comments as well. Um, and then, oh, oops, yes. And oh. then, uh, oh, thanks everybody. A lot of really nice folks in there saying cool things. Yes. Uh, we're having technical difficulties a little bit. Somebody, yes. somebody say that. <laughs> oh, we got so Tim is uh, Tim is a GCFT member, also a, uh, a wildlife care specialist. Moreno. Yeah, and he has been pretty funny because he's he's one of the people who's be like, you know, you should get on with uh, Jordan at some point. And hey, have you ever heard of jo uh, Jungle Jordan? And and so when he saw in my like team weekly update that this is going on, he just he was like, oh, I can't wait. So it looks like he threw some comments in there. I love uh, Tim. Mr. Rhino, man. Rhino, Tim. Yes, Rhino, Tim. <laughs> so he's yeah. asking, who does the training for the horses in our mounted units, and do they know husbandry behaviors? Um, so Roxanne, uh, L.A. zookeeper and equestrian, uh, longtime professional career both here in the United States, and she's also worked uh, abroad prior to GCF. Uh, she is the one that trains the horses and the novice rangers in the bush, sometimes taking wild horses and guys who don't speak the same language as her. And she's out there bareback riding with these units. Um, they do they do learn husbandry behaviors over time. She works as a training the trainer situation. So gets the horses established, the riders established, and then works as a mentor all the way through. So things like hoof care and uh, mouth care and then how to identify if the horse is needing additional support, uh, much like Jordan was saying, um, you know, you learn to read all of the behaviors of the animals you work with and you see all these intricacies. So if this tiny little thing is off, you need to understand why. Uh, and it might be something mm -hmm. that keeps you from actually will probably save the animal in a lot of cases. I mean, you still will find behaviors that you have never seen before. And you've worked with the animal for years, and it's like, whoa, what, what's going on with that? Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting stuff to see, and and trying to decipher animal behaviors and thoughts, you know, because we don't, they don't speak the same language language as us. We can't understand them, so we have to try to do our best to understand their body language and what their body is telling us. And it's pretty, you know, unless they're a bird and say, hey. Ouch. <laughs> right, <awesome>. exactly. <laughs> but it, yeah. even even some birds will like mimic sounds when they're not, like actually there's a cockatoo that's at the zoo that I'm at now that um makes different noises like he makes the sound he mimics the sound of of uh injured bird. <laughs> he does it on purpose. Oh, uh, for attention, <laughs> I would guess. Yes. <laughs> and he's like ah! Ah! It's like dude, relax. You're fine. And then you come, and then somebody comes running up, and he's like, he's "Score!" Like, yeah, he looks at you. It's the funniest thing, and he because he knows what he's doing. And <laughs> oh my goodness, birds. I I can re I I spent several good years working with birds, and my gosh, they're mm -hmm. like they're like three year olds with a pair of pliers that have ADD. <laughs> they right. are funny. Yeah. Uh, so a couple more comments to see. 
everyone's doing. I was going back to, I scrolled back up to the top of the comment section and I saw a lot of people that that watch me on, on my Instagram live where I always at the beginning asked people where they're from. I always, and I see a couple people saying where they're from and that's kind of like, I think that's something that might be a little shout out for um, me maybe. <laughs> hey, no, that's <laughs> awesome. Hey, yeah. well, honestly, it's, it's cool. It's fun to have a, uh a crowd from both sides. We we're doing a live broadcast on your channels and our channels. Yes. And it's cool to be able to use a platform like this, despite my uh, remote technical errors here. Oh yeah. Uh, um, actually, cool. can, can I, um, sorry, I, I mean to cut you off. I actually, since you just, it just dawned on me in my head on which for the people that are watching from my page, can we introduce you again? Um, for some yes. of those that just joined in later, um, what is global conservation force? You know, say that say that whole spiel again if you can. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, my name is Mike. I'm the president and founder of Global Conservation Force. Uh, I've founded it technically back in 2012. Uh, got the projects going and then formally launched it as a nonprofit 2014 into 15. Uh, prior to that, spent over a decade working as a senior wildlife care specialist at the Wild Animal Park and or the San Diego Zoo. Uh, working African and Asian animals of all different backgrounds, mixed species, uh, and working in wildlife rehab as well at the same time. Then became an anti-poaching ranger, which is where GCF really kind of came into play at this point. Uh, Global Conservation Force works in over 14 countries on the ground in frontline wildlife protection and conservation efforts dedicated in the umbrella efforts of rhino, elephant, pangolin, giraffe. African painted dog, saiga antelope, and snow leopards. So we approach that through anti-poaching operations where we have our own canines, mounted units, rangers, work with our own partnership rangers. We train the next generation of rangers, equip and sponsor the training for other programs while working with vets, rehab facilities, on the ground conservationists, and uh, other wildlife professionals to expand their operations, work al working alongside them as mentors and uh, project initiatives. Uh, based founders. And then we also work in the education, outreach, and awareness side, which is the in situ conservation learning long term plans for reducing like demand based issues in Southeast Asia and getting kids who live just outside the Kruger National Park and regions like that on their first game drives and wildlife uh, field trips so that they can become inspired and become the next generation of field ecologists, biologists, veterinarians, rangers, you name it. So uh, we work on quite a few things. Uh, we've been around for a while. Uh, the team is mixed from uh, over six different countries. Uh, well, the biggest team being in Southern California, kind of spread out, and the bigger part of the team from the U.S., but we have team members in Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, uh, Southern and Eastern Africa, and uh, primarily run on volunteers as well, so uh, yeah, outside I mean of our field staff. You guys are doing very, 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 very important work. And of course, I, I like to support. And uh, I actually did purchase a couple shirts. Um, and I was I was hoping I was like miraculously hoping, hoping they would they would be here so I could like wear it during the during the, oh, the new but, the new Pangolin Guardian shirts. No, I didn't buy one of those. I bought um the one with the, the five. Uh, oh, the SDM brand. Yes. Yeah, I bought yes. I bought. One one large men for myself, and then I bought two women's, so you can guys can get pushed over the threshold. I bought two women's ones because I was gonna I was gonna um uh raffle them raffle like not oh, raffle, cool but, you know like I was gonna do like a giveaway on my channel um so but um everyone that's 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 here from my page if you guys are still here please go visit them at um. Is it just global? Is it underscore global? What is it? It's just global conservation force on Instagram, mm -hmm. and you can find us the same on uh, on Facebook and Twitter. But it's also Facebook and Twitter are handles uh, Rhinos GCF. But so, uh, yeah, you yourself a T-shirt. <laughs> and uh, that's that's super cool. Honestly, let us know too when you get those. Uh, with the challenges of not being able to fundraise right now. We are being as creative as possible. So we've been doing host shirt campaigns so we don't have to buy large volume of shirts and styles. Mm. So these new platforms help us so we don't have the overhead cost of production mm -hmm. when we're not doing all these different styles of events and 
Uh, so we have another one right now, which is the Pangolin Guardians campaign, which it's a buy one, give one. And it's almost to the threshold of a buy one, give two shirt campaign. Ooh, so when you buy cool. one, you're giving one to a child, teenager, or a young adult in nice. Nigeria in one of the central locations and communities that's kind of focal on stopping uh, the wildlife trafficking and the poaching uh, in Western Africa. So we're working jointly with Pangolino on that, and we are working to uh, employ and train rangers and equip them. And then we're starting first with the education outreach side, which is celebrating World Pangolin Day, getting out these workbooks and these shirts for the community members, and then coming in with the ranger side as well. <laughs> Mike said, Tim, I wonder what that face is for. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> it's the most recent comment. He just says Tim. Oh, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> is Tim supposed to be doing something about that or? I don't know. I No, I'd probably just, they're probably just having a reason with each other on there. Oh, probably. Okay. Um, they're, 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 uh, they're good buddies. They give each other crap all the time. Yeah, so. I know. I know. I know. They know each other. <laughs> um, oh, he said he knows. Okay. <laughs> um, did you, so I don't, I don't mean like just jump in and ask, but did you like have questions or did you want to ask them for questions or? Yeah, let's. If, if folks have questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the comments. There, uh, it's always a lot more engaging to be able to take fielded questions from folks watching. Um, I mean, it helps. Yeah, I love the interaction. That, that's 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 kind of why I ask. I, I love, you know, because people ask me questions all the time, and I always I can't always get to them in the comment sections. I try, and I can say that not many people that run social media accounts will reply to almost every single comment oh, and wow. i try i kill myself doing it <laughs> that's a that's a dude major props on that that's a lot of work <laughs> it's, it's it's something i i feel like that's I, that's how i've always been i feel like every person's question is important and i just feel like you know that person may walk away not knowing the proper information and that's yes <laughs> that's how i am at, at zoos it's so funny when I'm at zoos, I can't go on, like if I'm busy working and I overhear someone talking about rhinos and they say an incorrect fact about them, I can't keep going without telling them what the right thing is in a nice fashion. I'm not like rude about it, but I, that's just how my brain works and I can't go on until it'll haunt me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh no, he thinks rhinos horns are made of bone. Yeah. Hit me. I I know I've I've, <laughs> it's like I've had my fair share of those two. You're like, ah, you're yeah. like, no, you're like, no, they're gonna tell 500 people that, and then like, you're gonna, gonna catch it in a something later on. Yeah, uh, I get it. Uh, it looks like we have a couple questions. Uh, so GCF has projects in pretty much all of Southern Africa and most of Eastern Africa, with a couple partnership projects in the central and western side of. Uh, Africa as well. Uh, it fluctuates based on what we're doing. Uh, we're not in every spot all the time. Our biggest efforts are definitely uh, in Southern Africa uh, for the most part. Uh, we're very much involved in the what folks will refer to as the rhino war or the major front for rhino conservation. Uh, we, we're working as hard as we can to try to put the fire out there as much as possible. Uh, and then we join efforts and create collaboration teams with other nonprofits in other regions where each one of us comes to the table to put more in specialty wise. So, cause there's a lot of specialty stuff in, in the field here. Uh, and then Ashley asked, what made me change from rehab to anti-poaching? Uh, I actually kind of still do both, uh, with my background. Uh, if I'm going to, for example, if I'm, we're working with uh, one of our partner rhino orphanages, uh, I can go there and help them with more advanced diet prep, animal husbandry training so that the animals are less interacted with, less hands on. We've done that uh, several times. Uh, I can come up with protocols for care and release and, and whatnot. And then at the same time, we might be teaching the animal care staff in Krav Maga that day and the extended anti-poaching unit in uh, advanced tracking and getting them uh, patrol equipment, boots, and uniforms. So I still do a little bit of everything. Uh, it, I, the only reason I left was to do more, I should say. The only reason I moved on was so that I could do more of everything. 
Mm-hmm. Tim's got a question for you there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> have you done pangolins for a wild Wednesday yet? Any interesting facts y'all got for us? Um, you know, it's funny about that. Cause I, I brought, I, I pretty, yeah, I did Tim a long time ago. Cause I actually brought, um, a friend of mine in, um, uh, Lauren, I brought Lauren. I can't think of her, her, uh, Lauren Ayers. Instagram. Yeah. What's her Instagram tag? Uh, Lauren's wild. Well, uh, Lauren's wildlife. Lauren's wildlife. There we go. Lauren's wildlife. Cause she, she, I remember she changed it and that was a whole thing. I remember I talked to her about that. Anyways, <laughs> yes. I don't know if you remember that, but I was like, why, why did you change your name? Um, cause it was zookeeper Lauren a long time ago, wasn't it? It was. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, why you? anyways, so Lauren, Lauren Ayers, and, um, she's a Who's... big, a big, 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 big person with pangolins. Um, I don't have any pangolin facts on the top of my head right now. Um, I'm sure you do though, Mike. <laughs> I you can share them. Yeah. So Lauren Ares, uh, is our GCF pangolin projects coordinator. Uh, she has a history of uh, working with them, uh, with some select confiscations here in the U S from years ago. And then she's also run our, uh, several different projects over the years, uh, from partnerships projects with save Vietnam's wildlife and some of our outreach efforts in Africa. She's currently the one heading up the campaign in Nigeria in partnership with the education, education outreach and aligning all of us for how we add the layers of conservation approaches. Uh, so pangolins, uh, there are eight species. There are four on the African continent and four in Asia. Uh, unfortunately they are the world's most trafficked mammal. Um, and it's due primarily to a Southeast Asia demand for either uh, a delicacy market for me and or the biggest one is the, the pangolin scales for products and traditional medicines. Mm -hmm. Just like rhino horn, pangolin yep. scales are the same as your fingernails and hair. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of getting, again, through those generations of folks that use these things from ancient past and now you, we've you tipped the scales you you can't i mean that was a big deal like in my rhino in my rhino talk that i used to always say is you can't it's really basically almost impossible to change someone's beliefs of thousands of years so you know even if you show them the science that you know there's no medicinal properties there's the belief that there is and you know, it's you can't just take away someone's belief. So that's why it's 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 I wouldn't say it's a losing battle, but it's it's just a hard fought battle that, you know, it's just going to take us to keep keep trying, keep teaching. You know, that's. Yeah, we've learned that you really have to uh, you have to, you know, put from all la layers, understand what the drive is, what the demand is, understand the educational gap, work with those who are willing to work with you on the next generation and create those future wildlife guardians. Cause I say, like you said, you know, it's like if somebody came in and for some reason eating pizza was bad and they came in and said, don't eat pizza. It's terrible. I love it though. You're ruining the environment and everybody's like, I love pizza. Like why? And, and, and then like, you're like, who is this foreign person yelling at me about pizza? Exactly. Uh, yes. Uh, not to, not to take any severity away from the, the, current crisis but right 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 that's kind of the onset you know we we all live in different worlds essentially but we're still on the same planet and yeah. cultures you know it's like you know we every one of us probably has a grandparent or a dad or a mom that's got some type of superstition or a yeah home remedy and if it would be like if the medical doctor just grilled the hell out of them and mm -hmm. told them that they were wrong and they were dumb and I mean, you just can't approach people that way if you really want to make solid progress you got to understand what's going on to make a a really wholesome kind of change and approach yeah. for a, a better generation yeah. here's a question from ashley jordan did you ever do wildlife rehab or only zookeeper so yes i never did wildlife rehab um i i've worked as a zookeeper for my entire career um up until now where i'm uh the job that i have now is education um, outreach, social media, and marketing um, with a little bit of zookeeping on the side. So I've kind of transitioned a little bit, but I have not, I have not left the zookeeping world. Um, not, not hundred um, percent. But some of the facilities I've worked, worked with, we have um, not really rehab, but we have taken a part in conservation projects with um, 
like reintroducing the uh, Western pond turtle, for instance, they because um, they've been getting you know taken out by invasive bullfrogs um, when they hatch because they're so young and small. These big giant invasive bullfrogs will eat the babies, and you know they're taking them out. So what we do is we raise them from from a young from from the hatch or excuse me from the egg, and we hatch them. We raise them to a certain size, and then we release them back into the wild. Um, so, so they're too big to be eaten by the bullfrogs, which are basically the ones taking them out. Um, so that's like a project we've done. And those are conservation projects at home, you know, right in our backyards. Yeah, those are, those are cool. I mean, and those are just as important. A lot of people think conservation has to be a world away or has to be exotic. There are hundreds of conservation projects here in the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, you name it. Um, People have kind of taken over the world and left wildlife with the pieces or the small places. And so there are a lot of people that are trying to pick those pieces up and make it sustainable uh, and survivable for these species. Uh, Tim has another question for us here. In the past, you've talked about how GCF's focal species are an umbrella. Can you explain what that means for this audience and how cheetahs benefit? Uh, Jordan, cheetah facts go, he says. Um, so umbrella species are really important. So um, I'll just use rhino and elephants to make it really simple. Uh, basically, a lot of these species share the same habitat spaces. And most often, the public is going to know the iconic species. So in the sense of rhino and elephant poaching, that's the same in a different sense for us in anti-poaching and wildlife protection. The biggest threat to that habitat, that community, and the survival of the ecotourism and the sustainability of that region is also that same threat. Um, when an elephant or a rhino is poached, you know, let's say a region loses its complete, like all of its rhinos, people aren't going to be going there anymore. If they lose their elephants as well, same thing. Also, the more animals lost, the less job opportunities, less lodges, less successful tourism is, the more the corruption is, the lower the education goes. It's a catastrophic fail. When we work with the communities to stabilize uh, these regions that are impacted by poaching, we address the most severe threat but also go top to bottom. So the umbrella effort, if a region has elephant poaching, it definitely is gonna have other poaching and trafficking issues too. But we're gonna train and equip the rangers and the conservationists and the communities to best handle all those situations surrounding the biggest problem so that they're best adapted for all the problems and create a better future. So cheetahs are actually in almost every single region we are working in, in Southern and Eastern Africa. Obviously it's, it's very limited now, uh, but our canines and our mounted units are definitely protecting cheetahs in multiple areas. And so are our ground units and many of our partner units. And so the cheetahs are getting protected by the rhino based pressure. And there might not be an actual dedicated pressure in that region to the cheetahs, but they are way safer when you've got ranger units and communities that want to protect the wildlife and save them for the future. So that's a, that's kind of a, a umbrella species in a, in a twofold for, the normal sense and then our uh, wildlife protection sense. There you go. Uh, cheetah facts. Um, here's yeah. one. Um, <laughs> here's one. The uh, so they cheetahs have uh, semi retractable claws. So that gives them the extra ability to, to run as fast as they do. It's almost like they have track spikes when they're running so they can dig into the dirt and get more grip. Whereas most cats walk with their claws in so random fact cheetahs are cool cheetahs, cheetahs are cool really all cool. around <laughs> i love cheetahs my favorite we favorite have favorite. another from ashley mm -hmm. so i just graduated with a wildlife biology degree a concentration in rehabilitation and i'm deciding where i want to work rehab zookeeper conservation i did hear you what you guys mentioned about starting lower level and going from there yeah i mean i we probably are both going to say the same thing just work wherever you can and work from yeah. there up. Yeah. Um, it, don't try to be too picky in the beginning. You can't. You can't be yeah. picky. It, it'll, it'll give you dead ends. So you'll want to be as wide as possible. You'll meet more people. You'll get more opportunities. And you'll take more roads and get to where you want to be. Literally throw out resumes and applications to everyone. To yes. everybody. <laughs> Literally everybody. And you'll see. You'll learn. You'll see and you'll learn what you prefer, you know, because you may think you might want a job as a zookeeper, but
but you get them like, eh, it's not really for me. Or you may think you want, you know, the life of a conservationist, but it's like, eh, I'm not really feeling fulfilled, you know, and then boom, you find out rehab is your favorite thing. You know, like it, you just, you have to just learn, you know, just, just go through and keep testing it out to, 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 to discover what is your actual passion. You right. know, like with me, zookeeping, I always knew I love to do it, but to tell you the honest truth, my passion actually lies with talking to people about the animals I work with. Isn't that weird? Like, I yeah, can, so, I can totally understand, you know, like I love working with the animals, but I, for some reason, I find it very enjoyable to tell people about me. My grandma who has dementia, you know, like she's, she's, she's on and off here and there. And I went to see her. I'm not over there as much. So she doesn't, she kind of, you know, she remembers who I am, but it takes her a second to get my name. Um, she always calls, calls me my brother name, my brother's name. But anyways, when I go over there, she always tells a story about how I was a four or five year old. She uh, walking around the zoo with her. And she said, Jordan would just talk to everybody, every stranger about the animals, no matter who they were and tell them about that animal. She said it was, she's like, Jordan, you were so annoying. <laughs> you, do you know what though? You know how important that is? I mean, so yeah. I have similar, similar, uh, yet different kind of thing on that. You know, working with animals is always my goal. But the more I worked with animals and the more I did in the animal field, the more I realized I needed to do more in the field. And that was my big calling was to advance and utilize all my skill sets and connections to further that field as much as I could. And so uh, working to get to that stage was part of my timeline. And now that I'm there, it's funny because like, I f force myself to jump on multiple different, you know, things to talk. I like to talk to people about this stuff. I love, it's my passion, but I always bury myself in the work and then like realize, whoa, weeks gone by. And then I'm like buried again. So like when folks like you are running wild Wednesdays and educational content, it's awesome because you're reaching new audiences, different people daily, weekly, and then it's reoccurring on your timeline. And so then when we get the opportunity to jump in, You've got a you got a big following that's asking good questions. You know, it's not yeah. like you know they're not asking basic questions anymore. Everybody's really engaged, right. and we've got some yes. solid content. Yes, I've definitely noticed that, and that's that's something like, like you bring up the Wild Wednesday. I, I I am surprised every week when these people are able to tell an animal by these weird, blurry, blown out pictures. I still <laughs> don't understand how they do it. I don't get it i don't know like i don't know if google is just that powerful <laughs> like are they just able to hey this is what it might be and they just scroll and scroll and they oh there it is right there like <laughs> oh my gosh it's, it's amazing how they get it so quick I, I actually play the game at work um to see if i can do it with with my coworkers, and i've actually been pretty good i've been surprised but you know I, i'm just saying like I'm, i don't know i can't say i know more than all these people that are that are following me, but you know, I, I feel like I work more closely with animals compared to a lot of the people. Right. And I'm just like, these people are amazing. You've you got, know? you've got the insiders in on it. And then you're also the content creators. So you're like, I'm going to get them this time. And you're like, dang it. They got me no, <laughs> every single time. I, 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 I'm, I feel like I'm this close to stumping them and I haven't stumped them in months and it's, it's bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can, I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. No, I'm, it's, I'm not bothered by it, you know, but you know what I mean. It's just like I know what you're saying. Yeah, you're like, yeah. you're like dang it, how am I gonna get? How am I gonna get a good one next week? Uh, sorry, I'm loud. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Looks like Tim has another in there, and mm -hmm. I guess for sake of time too, we'll we'll probably start wrapping up because uh, an hour has flown by. Yes, and uh, I know my pups are probably uh, needing to go outside pretty soon. Going good. <laughs> uh, so, Tim, Jordan, have you been able to uh, – sorry, I know you've been grinding on social, me social media for a few years and are an awesome role model for wildlife-loving minorities. Mm -hmm. I saw that you were recently recognized for this by a social media platform. Was it YouTube or Facebook? And how does this make you feel? Congrats. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. I wasn't going to talk anything about that, but that's I, can, I like talking about it. So – uh, the reason why I asked you to put it on Facebook, um, cause I've been pretty silent on YouTube. I was accepted into this Facebook, uh, creator program for, for black content creators. Um, it's called we, the culture and, uh, <laughs> it's, it's super cool. And the thing that surprised me the most were the people that are 
in this program. Like there are some well-known people that are that are like you know that are um you know verified and like actual people. <laughs> yeah, like real, real, real big people. players, real big names. I'm just like, do I belong in this? Like, was I an accident? You know, it's like, you know, like, <laughs> no. like, I'm not. You know, like, look, I, I get. Yes, all people are normal. All people are just regular people. I get that. But these people, like Damian Lillard, the NBA player, is in this. Um, wow. There's there are some names in this in this program, and I'm just like, okay, um, <laughs> this is a big deal, and I, I can't thank Facebook enough. And so I've been making, I, I just do what I already do, what I've always been doing, and Facebook is pretty much kind of backing me now. So I've been I've had a lot of newer faces been able to just to join me on my account. And um, it's been a it's been a huge huge deal for me, and it it makes it it's allowing me to reach more people. And that's really cool. It's, it still blows my mind. Like there's a lot of amazing people in this group. Like you know, not just you know, there's 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 you know, singers, dancers, comedians, um, you know, nerds. You know, you know that's that they're okay with being called that because I'm a nerd. And they will tell you that they're a nerd, and nothing's wrong with being a nerd. Nerds, are, they're the cool nerds are the new cool, you know. It's and it's, that's really it's that's really how it is. And you know, but all this kind of stuff. And there's there's some there's some uh, political people, and and then you have me. There's like, I think that's why I, I may have been may have been picked, I guess, because there's not many people in you know black people in this world that are making videos about it. And yep. I I. I it's very it's that's why I kind of find it hard for me to like um collaborate with people of color, which you know right now this is Black History Month. Um, you know, and we're we're trying to put an emphasis on co-collaborating, you know, with with others that are in the program. Um and it's kind of difficult because I'm my, my stuff is very different. Like it's not like I can't I can't see a way that I can collaborate with a yoga, you know, person. You know, like I don't. I'm trying to like. I'm trying to trying to figure it out. Like I don't know what to do. Like, do I just show them animals and that's it? Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know. They could create. They could like create uh, symbols for each one of the, your key species that you're gonna learn. Well, or hey, to share. Yeah, like they could do. I don't know. I whatever. Like, I guess you're a better content creator than I am. Like, I don't. I don't know. Why. I have no idea. Um, but anyways, yes, yeah, so that's that's Facebook, and so I'm pretty proud of that. But yeah, well, congrats. That's really cool. I mean, shoot, that's. That's a landmark achievement right there, and that's that's really cool. And I I know from experience, as you do, you 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 put your head down and grind away at getting towards your goal and your passion. And a lot of times, you're tired, wiped out, don't feel like you have the energy to do it again tomorrow. Oh, I'm tired. Just keep up and I'm go. Tired. <laughs> I'm tired. Yeah. Like right yeah. now, I am exhausted. But I, when it comes to this kind of stuff, this is what I live for. You know, this is what I push. Because it's important. Because I feel as though people are not to sound like like hockey or anything, but I feel like people are relying on me yes. to bring them information. <laughs> like well, I am their source of info. But yeah, well, so. you're you're a you're a channel. You know, you're a channel. You, people are tuning in. Um, and just as a good point of context, right there. If you guys aren't following Jungle Jordan from our GCF world, please give him a follow. Hop in there. Uh, Lots of good content, lots of educational materials, uh, suitable for all ages. Yes. Uh, really good stuff. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure. And, and thanks for carving out time for us to chat, shop, and everything. Um, I will gladly do it again. This is amazing. And I'll definitely yeah. be contacting you uh, about those t-shirts so we can, like, I guess, so we can, you know, collaborate on what you wanted to do, what you were talking about. Um, sure. Yeah. So we can talk about that. And uh, for people that have came from my page. Please go give GCF a follow um, over on all the platforms, Facebook, YouTube. Um, you guys are on Twitter, too, um, yep. and Instagram. Yep. So thank looks you, guys. Like, looks like Tim had another fleeting question in there. He, he, he told me he was going to bring up a back question, and I'll go ahead and answer it. So since I've been uh, at home in San Diego versus in the project sites, uh, with everything going on in the closures and pandemics, we've been also working in our local community in our backyard. There's a rare Shaw's agave plant that is here in San Diego, and it blooms once every 25 years, and then it dies. So it's like these, they like, they bud into a new plant, 
grows for 25 years. It shoots up a stalk, flowers bloom. It only blooms for like, I think three weeks to five weeks total. And then the black, that part of the plant dies. Well, there's a Mexican long tongue bat that mm. comes into San Diego County from its normal range. And it's not documented well in many of the regions here in Southern California because of how rare the Shazagave is. So right now we have got a camera trap project going to document all the visitors on this really rare bloom. And this literally, uh, there's like probably 15 plants spread out between like a strip of maybe a quarter of an acre in wow. Point Loma. Wow. And so uh, <laughs> that's what he's asking about. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, conservation in our backyard. I mean, like there's a camera trap with a, full system monitoring night system, you know, like night camera system. And like I could, I had to point it towards the sky and redirect it. So it didn't catch cars moving in the background or people on their balconies because I didn't want it to like be weird. And I, I didn't want it to trip. So like we had to get creative because it's, it's, it's literally smack dab in a community garden and an urban environment. And uh, these bats are a key species for pollinating this rare plant. And they are probably the dispersal, the main dispersal method because of how they actually feed on the uh, flower itself. So, so you already have footage for this bat? We don't yet. Uh, we we you do not. Okay. just got the camera trap up. Got uh, it. Uh, was it Friday last week? And uh, so far we've uh, had lots of bee activity and wind. Um, okay. And it hasn't, the bat hasn't been documented in this little patch. This patch may be too new. Uh, oh. in this historical range so uh, if we do catch it on the camera trap it'll be the first time ever documented in the point loma peninsula well i'll be uh, talking to you about that i'm reading tim's comment and yes I, yes tim you are correct my mind was already going so um yes we'll, we, we might be talking mike if if uh you uh if Yes or no. Even if you guys don't see it, I still want to, I might end up doing that for um, a segment. So yeah, I'm in uh, the, you know, honestly, I, I love bats. I've got plenty of comical stories with bats. Uh, uh, I'll save those as a uh, next time to keep people yes, on the hook. Definitely. And uh, I see it. One more comment in there. If you just caught in at this moment, it is going to post to all of our channels and it oh, will yeah. save. So you'll, you'll be able to see it on all of Jungle Jordan's channels uh, that it streamed to today and the GCF channels. You'll find it on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I believe it's too long to put on Instagram independently so we could save it and break it up into sections. Um, but thanks again, Jordan. It was a blast. And thank you all for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Mike. Look forward to doing it again. Yes. All right, guys. All right, Take everybody. Care. Keep well. We'll chat soon. <laughs>